The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. I think it's prudent to learn as much as we can before these owls become threatened or even rare. My favorite story was the Oasis of the Kingfisher. What was significant about this is that I had all three species of kingfishers feeding at the same time at one location. To work for 20 years on one project and see it go from a design on paper to over 2,000 acres of wetlands is extremely rewarding. Texas Parks and Wildlife, taking Texans outside for 30 years. Shopping strips and homes and urban expansion. It's growing just like every other place in Sunbelt areas. Urban El Paso is expanding. There's about 700,000 people in the county and we are adjacent to Mexico, Juarez, where there's at least two million people. But as more people make this region home, some other desert dwellers are being displaced. Among them are burrowing owls. That other one's still in the tree. Fortunately, biologist Lois Ballin is looking out for the owls. They are endangered in several other states, but not in Texas. Right now, there are species of concern here. They're endangered in Canada and a threatened species in Mexico. So it would be good to have a good plan for them before these owls become threatened or even rare. Burrowing owls don't live like most owls. These are terrestrial owls that live underground. These birds also borrow their burrows. They need natural areas where there are other animals like badgers or ground squirrels, rock squirrels, or prairie dogs. With the desert being encroached by urbanization, they're just losing more and more of their natural habitat. The good news is these owls can take advantage of unnatural habitat. It means I'm really not very happy that you're here. Along the Mexican border, at a natural area in eastern El Paso, Lois has been building artificial burrows for the owls since 2006. Here are some supplies you're going to need to make a burrowing owl nest box. Uh, the dog is optional. Get out of here. Send that. A reasonable size nest box, probably 16 inches high. And then we have pipes coming out, PVC pipes. That's their burrow. The whole idea here is designing the perfect, hopefully, artificial nest site for the owls that will enhance their success. All that has to be underground. OK, there you go. That will be the top. Makes it a lot faster when you have help. OK, you got it there? With her volunteer crews, Lois has installed 16 artificial burrows here. A little off. And building the burrows has presented an opportunity to study the owls more closely. So this is the camera right here. So right under this bucket is the nest box. The rocks discourage anybody from their curiosity, in case the signs aren't enough. <laughs> Two owl homes have been fitted with video surveillance systems. It's just a little camera. 
three nice large solar panels providing the energy. And this little gadget here is called a solar charge controller. And this is the DVR that's going to record all the data. And having the cameras underground gives the biologists a lot of new tools. It's pretty awesome. Maybe the most impressive gadget transmits the video wirelessly, so Lois can check on the birds without disturbance or a drive across town. Okay, look at this here. These are newly hatched, and they're just little white powder puffs, I'd say one day old. Not surprisingly, the cameras are revealing much about the hidden lives of burrowing owls. Number of eggs laid, number of nestlings, their behavior or their prey items. This one looks like it might be foraging. Another mouse. They have a pretty wide variety of diet, but the main staple is rodents. They also eat birds, frogs, and lizards, and even a snake. Lois is also learning how the owls can become prey themselves. I have had coach whips go into the burrows, but fortunately the owls were smart enough not to go anywhere near that snake. I went to check a nest box, which at one point had eight eggs in it. And when I checked it, there were no eggs and there was a snake skin left behind. Probably a gopher snake ate all the eggs and then decided that was a good place to shed. But the skunk discovery is the most recent, rather astonishing discovery. Skunks are going into the burrows and occupying them, and in some cases, preying on the owls themselves. It was a shocking discovery to learn that a striped skunk would eat a burrowing owl. But this has happened two or three times now. So this is another aspect to the design of the burrows. Now I have to address how do I exclude skunks. We'll find something. Information is gathered from cameras underground with the owls, as well as from cameras outside, both artificial and natural burrows. But some kinds of knowledge can only come from hands-on research. Today, we are going to try to capture some owls and ban them. Among other things, leg bands can reveal if the same owls return each year and how long they live. I'd like to catch these guys because I know they're both adults. There's a much higher rate of survival if they've made it to adulthood. Okay. Traps are placed over burrow exits and checked throughout the morning. It's just sort of random when you're gonna catch them. There have been days I have uh, captured nothing, so any capture is a good one. We know that they hunt at night, um, but they also hunt during the day. And I also know from my videotape that they nap. So I think they're more nappers. The owls spend an awful lot of time preening and preening each other. Lots of uh, wing stretching, and leg stretching, and bobbing up and down when they sense danger. And their antics are just adorable. Hours after being set, the traps remain empty. No owls. They took the morning off. But before the day is done... We got one. Success. Do you hear that bill clattering? Not a happy camper. So we'll just take the whole trap back. None of them are happy to be trapped, but I try to be as quick as I can. When you see them at a distance, they look large and they're all puffed up. And then when you get them in your hand, you see how tiny they are. Well, this is not always graceful. I cover them first, and now he won't be afraid. Are there migrating owls just migrating through? Are there owls that come here just to breed? With an ID number, I can determine that information. So this fella is 74. 131.2, 165 on the wing is 76. 
Lois collects her data quickly. This bird's ready to go. And the owl is soon on its way. There, look at that. The longer this research continues, the more it reveals about the secret lives of burrowing owls. But these owls are already increasing awareness about this urban desert habitat and the web of interconnected creatures that call it home. It's really important in a desert environment that there are these oases for wildlife. Part of our mission is to get people outside enjoying nature. So the owl is like a representative. Some biologists call them Hollywood animals. This is a very charismatic animal that people are very attracted to. People see an owl up close, then they get appreciation for the owls and the habitat. While further research may be the best way to ensure these owls will always have a place to call home. This bird has come back two years in a row. Some extra care and compassion. Good information. Can't hurt. Okay, baby, okay. It's very difficult to work with any animal and not become attached to them, even though there's really no relationship with the owls. Just watching them grow up and watching their behavior and their antics, definitely I'm very fond of them. This project was funded in part by Wildlife Restoration Fund. We can stop Matt over by the cell 17 or cell okay, 16 to work for 20 years on one project and see it go from a design on paper to, uh, to over 2,000 acres of wetlands functioning uh, as designed is extremely rewarding. This project serves as a real model for folks all over the country. Well, it really came to be with a lot of people uh, years ago really putting their heads together and looking for an alternative to creating a new reservoir. We partnered with the Tarrant Regional Water District that supplies water to a large portion of the Metroplex. Our missions are very different, but this is really finding middle ground where we can meet water needs in a wildlife friendly and a natural resource friendly manner. We're open for waterfowl hunting in the fall to bird watching throughout the spring. TPWD was able to substantially improve our wildlife habitat here on this wildlife management area. You know, we've had to work together as a team in order to, to make sure that this whole project has become a success. Everyone is very passionate about what they do, so we work until we get the job done and help each other out. We have increasing demands on water use. There's always gonna be a need to provide plenty of good drinking water and habitat for both people and wildlife. We pump water from the Trinity River into a series of sediment basins, and then we flow it through a series of wetland cells. The wetland plant community and the wetlands themselves act as a filter, filtering out the nutrients. If that water were put directly into a reservoir, that would lead to substantial algal blooms in those reservoirs. So we're using those wetlands to take up those nutrients and clean this water and that water is relifted into the Rickson Chambers Reservoir and ultimately pumped back to the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. This wildlife management area has become a very important public hunting area. This is a very important stopover area for migratory birds. We manage these wetlands to have as much available food to these birds, either through seeds or invertebrates. The cattails are kind of an invasive species, and if you, you know, if you don't keep those knocked back, they're low quality for waterfowl, number one, and number two, they don't filter water like some of these other type plants do. For the average public hunter that comes in, they see it and they're like, man, it looks amazing. Just knowing how much time behind the scenes it takes to make it look amazing is pretty cool. How much work and sweat and dedication we have out here. I bet we can get their teamwork is really outstanding. Their management of this property and even the philosophy of this water reuse project. It's the first of its kind in the country and their ability to take this project and deliver it in such a high quality manner is really above and beyond the capacity we could ask of any biologists and technicians and this team has done an exemplary job.
It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. Lee Smith is one of more than 30 producers, photographers, writers, and editors who have contributed to the show since its first broadcast in 1985. Hi, my name is Lee Smith. I was a producer at Texas Parks and Wildlife for 25 years. My favorite story was the Oasis of the Kingfisher. And what was significant about this is that I had all three species of kingfishers feeding at the same time at one location. I don't think that will ever happen again. And it was very easy to produce because all I had to do was intro it and then just let the kingfishers do their thing. In the brush country of Southwest Texas, my uncle has a ranch. Some may say it's a desolate place. But to me, this land has a special kind of beauty. Scattered around the ranch are several stock tanks. These are man-made ponds built to supply livestock with water. They also can provide wildlife with some excellent habitat. I've hunted and fished these tanks since I was seven years old, and I've been shooting video here for over a decade. I've photographed all sorts of animals that stop by these tanks for refreshment. I've been so lucky to come out here and experience this part of the natural world. I'm not sure how many sunrises and sunsets I've witnessed here, but each one has something special about it, something unique. One December morning, I was shooting video at one of my favorite tanks. A snipe and a greater yellow legs were keeping me company when a belted kingfisher arrived and began to hunt breakfast. It's always a special treat to watch the amazing flying ability of kingfishers. They can stop and hover wherever they want. And then plunge head first into the water after their quarry. After they catch a fish, they kill it and spend some time tenderizing their meal. There are three species of kingfishers in North America. This is the belted kingfisher. They're common throughout the United States and can be seen along ponds, lakes, and rivers. They tend to hunt from a variety of favorite perches from around the shore.
One morning, I noticed something different. This was a kingfisher, all right, but at least twice as big as the belted kingfishers. It also sounded different. Belted kingfishers were the ones I usually saw. They get their name from the blue belt across their chest. This is a male. Females are very similar, but with a chestnut coloring on their chest below their belt. The new arrival was a female ringed kingfisher. This was surprising, since ringed kingfishers are a tropical bird and not usually found this far north. On the males, the chestnut color covers the entire breast, but the females include a blue band and a white stripe. Then I noticed something even more amazing. Just below, in the same tree, was a green kingfisher. Green kingfishers are the smallest, quietest, and most reclusive. Texas is the only state that has all three species. The 1,000 square miles of the Rio Grande Valley is normally the only area where you have a chance to see all three. But here I was 200 miles to the north, and I had all three species within 30 yards of each other. If I hadn't captured this on video, no one would have ever believed me. All three species, at one time, at one location. This went on for one week, and I came back every day to watch. Over the next year, the waters that were so full of life disappeared in the drought. I came back, but the kingfishers did not. But for one week, one winter, it was an oasis for me and the kingfishers.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.